Hello everybody, welcome to that word chat. It's good to see you all again. Uh, today uh, we're gonna we have uh, Ann B. Friedman uh, as our guest. Friedman is the visionary behind Planet Word, the Planet Word Museum in Washington, DC. The number one place I have been dying to visit as soon as I can actually feel comfortable going back to Washington, DC. Um, I, I haven't felt comfortable going to Washington DC for the past four years but that's a different <laughs> it's a different story uh, uh, Friedman also is the um, uh, the developer of uh, uh, the Franklin School a historic um, building 19th century building uh, important in the educational history of DC and I suppose the nation and uh, um, so she developed the building to create the museum the museum celebrates words language and reading uh, she is a, a lifelong lover of reading. She's worked as a copy editor, so cool, a bunch of copy editors in the, in the room today, and a translator, and, uh, and she also, and then she became a, a reading and writing instructor. So, um, so welcome, nice to see you. Thank you. I love yeah. that musical introduction. That's a first for me. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I, I, my, my son did that, he is available for hire, let me know. I'll, you know, I'll hook you up. Uh, he's a he's a, a composer, and uh, and I, I feel like I, I have a theme song now. So if I'm ever on the Tonight Show. I don't know if they still do that, but it used to be you know people walk out and they play your theme song, and I think this will be mine if I ever if there's ever a reason for me to be invited on the Tonight Show. But we'll see. Um, so so you, you, you the museum opened in. Uh, 2020, October. early 2020, October. Well, October, October but it. 22nd, 2020. Um, okay. And we were open for three weeks. Okay. <laughs> and then we closed. <laughs> you did, right. So that's, so my first question, you decided to open a museum during a global pandemic. Was that um, It was, uh, it was definitely not planned. Yeah. Uh, we were supposed <laughs> to open May uh, 31st of 2020, um, yeah. and then we had to be, uh, mobilize some of our workers, and so things were delayed, and, um, hmm. and that's how the date got pushed to October. But we opened on purpose. We're a museum of, about words and language. And there has never been a time, certainly in my life, when there was more focus in America, in the world, on words and how they were being used. And I was determined that, that Planet Word was going to open before the elections. Not that we would have a big political voice or anyone would notice, but mm -hmm. I would feel good about what we had done and what we stand for, which is words, being aware of your words, the words used by yourself, around you, and um, using them for good. Civil dialogue and not to bully and... Mm -hmm. We had to open before the election. Yeah, and that's great. So that's why that happened. And and part of it's not just words; it's it's, it's using words um, for truth. And words can be misused so badly, and we've seen that. That uh, um, and and we still see that 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 the words we choose in the political context is um, is. Is very important to public opinion, and and it's amazing. I think if we, I'm sure people have studied this, that word choice in certain situations has really sort of affected the outcome. Absolutely, and yeah. you know, there used to be the museum in Washington, mm -hmm. and and I had been very careful in planning our galleries and exhibits, and to stay away from. Shakespeare and from the news and from journalism because I thought they are already museums dedicated to those subjects mm. and they do a really good job and so 
you know, I'm not trying to compete with them. But then when the museum closed, there was a vacuum. There was a right. definite, uh, you know, way that words are used that wasn't treated in a museum anymore. And so, mm. you know, we don't really, you know, tackle that space. But, but we do have an exhibit now on news literacy and, you know, uh, we will we'll we'll cover that topic in our auditorium when people can gather hmm. there and listen to speakers so um that that was important to me too yeah that's great you've anti that and you anticipated one of my questions i was because mm -hmm. the museum closed not too long ago within the last couple of years i think yes. um and uh and it did um i i don't know i mean to, to be perfectly frank i don't know that it was the the best um presentation of journalism and news. I mean, it had some good elements to it and I thought some sort of weak elements to it. And mm -hmm. I think maybe one thing that doomed it was just, it was the this amazing piece of real estate. <laughs> um, that is what doomed in, it. Yeah. Um, you know, the mortgage yeah. and this beautiful, but too big building yeah. with, you know, in fact, I had looked at um, spaces in the museum. When we were looking for a home for Planet Word, mm -hmm. I actually talked to their executive director and, and we had some discussions about uh, auditoriums that they could give to Planet Word if we were housed inside the museum. I mean, we were so mm -hmm. sort of synergistic. Um, but then uh, they changed leadership and those discussions ended. And so then I was back on the street trying to find yeah. a home for Planet Word again. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like what you ended up with is probably a better uh, thing than the back closet at the museum. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's actually a match made in heaven. Um, I don't know if you want to show that slide now. And, you know, sure. I'll talk a little bit about the building that we're in yeah absolutely good time to do that we uh the uh planet word and your folks put together a little bit of a uh a slideshow so we'll show the start of that um i can find the right button all right uh, you'll tell me if that's there it not, is that's there it is. Good. great so okay. um there you can see uh the we're in the Franklin School, which is mm -hmm. a National Oops. Historic Landmark building. Oops. And me, um, okay. there, there's a nice fall picture of the Franklin School. And mm -hmm. what that meant was that um, it, it had been empty for a decade and unoccupied, allowed to really deteriorate. Um, but because it's a National Historic Landmark two times over. Hmm. The exterior is fully protected. No changes can be made to the exterior. And it is one of the rare buildings in Washington, D.C., where the interiors are also protected. So hmm. we could do very little in the way of big changes, moving walls, things like that, on the interior to take it from being a school built in 1869 and turn it into a 21st century high-tech museum. But yeah. um, we think we did that really successfully. And um, one of the reasons why I say it was a match made in heaven is because of the history. So the Franklin School was a National Historic Landmark, number one, because of its architecture. It's red brick. The uh, architect, Adolf Kloos, was known for being a master of brick. And there are several buildings in Washington, D.C. to this day that were designed by him, and they are red brick. So it's mm -hmm. pretty good, uh, you know, possibility that if you see an old school and it's red brick, and it might be Adolf Kloos's work. Mm -hmm. um, but secondly... In 1880, Alexander Graham Bell sent a message using light waves from probably 
uh, that flat roof on the left side of your screen. Um, and we don't know for sure, but we sent a message using light waves from the building to a nearby location. And we, and uh, it's considered the birthplace of wireless. So oh. it combines this, you know, history of education and, um, you know, Western in telecommunications history in this building where we are sort of teaching and, uh, and also using technology and communication. So it, it's just a kind of a match made in heaven. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. cool. that's um, you could yeah. flip to the. Yeah. Should we go back to the? I, to the interior slides, maybe. Okay. That show okay. This, we go. Uh, yes, this is this is not that's, current. That's what I inherited. Um, I got <laughs> a ninety-nine year lease from the. Uh, District of Columbia for $10 a year, but in exchange for restoring and rehabilitating the building. And you can see what shape it was in. All of that stuff, the flaking on the floor, that's basically lead coated paint. And mm. so we had to do hazmat abatement for two months and get rid of all the lead. Um, the black mold, because it, it was actually raining inside the building in places. The ceilings had caved mm. in, the, the floors were soggy. Um, not a lot of asbestos. People assume, you know, that's what needed abatement, but because the building was so old, there wasn't mm. a lot of asbestos used actually in it. And um, so we cleaned that up. I think there are a couple more slides of what a mess it was. Yeah. There were pigeons flying in the attic. Right. There you can see the ceiling that had fallen in. And the whole building was just, you know, the different users hadn't paid any attention to its historic status or they weren't careful. This was the attic. And there were pigeons flying in there and all that white that you see on the rafters, that's sort mm. of guano, pigeon droppings. Sure. Um, but we turned that space into a new event space. We brought in steel beams and reinforced the floor. We replicated frescoes that were on the walls. And um, now we, we got that space out or weddings and whatever you want. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so we'll, we'll get to the sort of the, what it looks like now, but I, I kind of went out of order. I apologize. I, I skipped yeah. the, uh, the mission. Um, so. so let's talk about the planet word mission and, and people are probably looking at that photo and thinking, Oh my God, I, <laughs> I need that in my living room. Um, but we'll get to that later. That's on the next that's yeah. future slide. So, um, so, well, here, I guess, maybe, you know, we can just go back to why did I do this in the first place? I don't know um, mm -hmm. if you want the slide up or not, but... Um, yeah, well, we can, people have read the mission. We can... Yeah. Time to look yeah. at you again, so... So, like you said in your introduction, um, my last job was as a beginning reading and writing teacher. And that was after we had lived overseas for a decade in Jerusalem, in Beirut, to war-torn cities. So when we, when we moved back to the United States, I you know, vowed to myself that I would do something to build community because that was obviously lacking in Beirut and Jerusalem. And so I started teaching first uh, a class on my own on world cultures to little children. And it was really successful and popular. So I went back to graduate school and got a degree in um, a master's in teaching. And I ended up uh, really needing a part-time teaching job because of our lifestyle and 
my kids' ages, and the only part-time teaching job that existed in the Montgomery County Public Schools where we live was a, a reading and writing teacher for beginning reading and writing. And I mm -hmm. had never been a babysitter. I never thought I would teach six-year-olds, you know, but it was really the most joyous teaching job you could ever imagine. And you're really starting kids off with an appreciation for stories and literature and vocabulary and poetry and all these things that they've never really been exposed to. And so to have that opportunity to turn kids on to something that was going to bring joy to their lives forever was hmm. really wonderful. And um, then I retired in 2011. I was like, what am I going to do now? I really love teaching. I loved literacy. And um, so I tried a few different part-time volunteer positions. Then nothing was satisfactory. But I read a New York Times article about this new museum of mathematics in New York City that was bringing math concepts to life through technology. And I read that story and I said, that's it. That's what I can do. I'll make a museum, not about numbers and math, but about words and language. Because why was this so important to me? It was, I was really despairing about, you know, all the trends in literacy and how people weren't reading for pleasure, you know, and all the trends were going the wrong way. Surveys showed though that readers are more likely to be volunteers, to be active in their communities and to vote. And you should be a, a critical thinker to vote well too. And all the skills that come from reading and literacy so I thought maybe a museum could make reading like cool again. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can create a buzz about reading and language that would bolster democracy. I mean, that sounds a little bit highfalutin, you know, uh, but, but that was really my vision that somehow this museum could make reading cool again for at least some portion of the population. And um, and so I started with that idea and I said, okay, I have all these ideas. I can figure out, mm, you know, concepts that I would teach, uh, books that I would teach about. Um, and I listed all of them and I looked up on Google Museum consulting, because the one thing I didn't know about was building a museum. Mm -hmm. And I, w I was connected with a company called Lord Cultural Resources, and they turned out to be the leading museum consulting company. And they liked my idea. I just called, called them and they assigned me to a team in New York City and they did a market feasibility study 90 pages came down to washington interviewed all sorts of people you know what would you think about this kind of museum how big should it be and um the feedback was really positive mm -hmm. so then we did focus groups kids 10 to 12 years old boys and girls separately and then uh, parents of kids 10 to 12 years old, because that was the target audience that we thought about. Um, sort of the age when kids lose their enthusiasm for reading, um, but also have the ability to think about abstract concepts, to be empathetic. And um, the facilitator of the focus group said in her 25 years, of doing focus groups. He had never had an idea um, that had such a positive response. Hmm. So 
Okay, and 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 I can see that. You know, we had sort of one-way glass, and I could see how the kids were responding to different ideas, and and, and then you could do this at the, you know, and it's a it's a museum of words because we didn't say that we didn't use the word museum. We didn't say what this place would be. It was really, what would you think about a place where this would happen? And they were so enthusiastic and excited that I just kept going, you know, and say, okay, I got to do this. <laughs> and right. Uh, so. Right. Uh, so the, um, you 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 mentioned the I I. I I'm not sure. You mentioned the young ages. Is it something that is appealing to? Um, it, it seems a little bit older than you know when you were teaching beginning readers. Oh, it's it is it's a museum for eight years old and above. There are very huh. sophisticated parts of the museum. Mm -hmm. It is not a children's museum. Yeah. Okay. We have a. We ask our uh, people in the audience to um, offer their questions that they have and um, sure. come on screen and do that. I think we have one, right, Heather? We do. Yes. Our next question is from Kevin. Kevin, if you want to unmute and ask. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I see on the Planet Word uh, Museum website, planetwordmuseum.org, uh, that. The museum is billed as, as the first voice activated museum. And I'm really curious about that. So exactly what does that mean? And how did this innovation come about? Um, so I sort of stopped my, my history. Um, so after all this positive feedback and focus groups, then I had to find a building, found the building, got the lease, and simultaneously had to find an exhibit designer to work with who would take my list of 250 ideas and narrow that down and turn that into exhibits that fit into the building. And that was local projects here in New York City. There, and, and, and I only interviewed firms that used technology because I knew that had to be the innovation that brought words and language to life. And they came to me with the idea and they said, how about if we make this a voice activated museum, which fit perfectly with, you know, my focus on all the language arts, reading, writing, listening, and speaking. So, I said, yeah, try it, you know, show me what you what you mean. And so, um, Mark, I don't know, maybe it's easiest to explain the voice activation by showing the different galleries because sure. we have different kinds of voice activation in each gallery. Yeah, let's let's do that. We'll go to uh, we saw where the, the museum was yeah. <laughs> and it's a little bit more clean, a little bit cleaned up now. Um, I will share my screen again, and uh, so that's and our I did, I, right. I did, language comes to life because I, that I, I do. I, I'm sorry, I, can't, I don't mean to interrupt. I rude of me to interrupt. But I just wanted to say thank Kevin for the question and say we're going to do a special show just with Kevin's bookshelf. Um, I know <laughs> people were looking at what he had behind him, but that was. Um, I was fascinated, so we're going to have to have him back to talk about that. Uh, so I, I'm sorry. So yes, so the museum where language comes to life. All right. And oops, there we go. So oh, that's interesting. There, so that is our second gallery, and it's sort of the iconic gallery of Planet Word. And it's a gallery of basically etymology. Where do words come from? The story of English. So what you're seeing on your screen is a 22 feet tall, 40 foot wide, three dimensional word wall. So the, all the letters that you see there and um, they 
come from a thousand words, three dimensional words that go from very large size on the bottom to teeny tiny on the top, uh, stacked on top of each other. And through projection technology and, uh, you know, cameras and uh, speakers, images are projected on top of all those words. And you hear a narrator's voice. Uh, he's a voice actor. We hired him to read our script, which is all about the history of the English language. But it's a non-linear story. So first you hear about, you know, the, the real origins and the, you know, the Vikings and the French in 1066. But eventually we talk about other ways that words came into English. And for instance, one of those ways is, you know, we borrowed words from other languages. And so you'll see on lit up the words on the word wall that come from, let's say, Spanish. And one of those words is burrito. And if someone chooses to hear about the origin of burrito, they say that word into, you can see these, um, circular microphones at the bottom of your screen mm -hmm. that, that our voice recognition technology picks up that someone said burrito and wants to hear the story of that word and the text and the narration switches to telling the story about burrito and you see a burro walk across the screen and hear it braying. And so everything is activated by what the visitors to the museum say in response to questions from the moderator, from the narrator. Hmm. And so it's a very non-linear approach to telling where words come from in English and it's responsive to the people who are there, who shout out, who tell people, use your outdoor voices, don't be shy. And it's really great. So when we have uh, a discussion about onomatopoeia, another way that words come into English, mm -hmm. um, you know, that you can choose burp and clash and splash and flutter and zip and whiz and those words are lighting up and the sound is you know uh projected so it's a lot of fun and it responds to the visitors hmm. i i'm an etymology geek i would probably want to like just schedule a, a day and spend, go through every single word there because that's so that's so very but, interesting but the thing is mark so every single word isn't uh, part of the experience. No, no. But I, I, I'd be happy with those. Is there a thousand words you said? Well, there are a thousand words, but the ones where you can hear the story about their hmm. origin mm -hmm. are particularly chosen uh, because they, there's a good story behind them sure. and they appear physically in the middle of the word wall. That uh, is sort of the hot spot where the projection technology can interact with the letters. So, I see. So the words were chosen very specifically and carefully placed uh, to interact with the lights and everything. Mm -hmm. So so if I shout love, is that going to give me a story? You would not be given that opportunity no. Okay. So, for instance, the experience starts with the question, do you know what the 10 most common words in English are? Oh, okay. And they're the, some of the very large Germanic words that are in the last two rows. 
mm-hmm. and people shout those out. And then, you know, if we're talking about uh, words that are, you know, we have Germanic, French, sort of coupling, you know, so snake would light up, and then you could choose serpent to go with that. You know, so it's very programmed, um, but the idea is that you will become interested in the subject, and you'll, you'll want to learn about that further and get deeper into the subject. We are offering a little taste of, hmm. of this. Yeah, that's terrific. All right. Uh, and then here's... So here, voice activation is completely different. Um, this is our largest gallery. It was the assembly hall of the original school. It's about 22 foot ceilings, frescoes that were replicated on the walls, and this gigantic interactive globe that hangs from the ceiling. And the cool thing about this globe is that it also folds in on itself and retracts up to the ceiling. Oh. And we can take out all the iPads and the, um, the guardrail and clear the room hmm. to rent out for special events. But when visitors are there, the globe is surrounded by iPads and each iPad has a language ambassador on it. Uh, we have 30 language ambassadors, uh, 28 languages from around the world, indigenous, endangered, you know, common languages, um, and two signed languages. And you walk up to an iPad and you tap on the screen and the language ambassador starts to talk to you, says hello, and tells you too many lessons about his or her language and asks you to repeat phrases. And as you do, when you get to the end of a mini lesson, it, the iPad tells you, look up. And when you look up at the globe, it's taken over by a design that relates to the lesson you just did. So when there are a lot of people at the iPads and they're finishing lessons all at different times, the globe is lighting up all around you in different mm. designs that you don't expect. Um, mm. And it also has sound. So some of the, uh, the takeover moments have sounds of fish swimming and uh, thunder and uh, champagne glasses clinking. And mm. so it's a, a fun experience. And so we're using voice activation to encourage people to try speaking different languages. Right. So uh, it's this is, I think by design, it has to be mostly a um, a museum about the English language, but you have a lot of elements about the idea of language and other languages as well. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, because it's in Washington, D.C., and in America, um, a lot of it is the museum is about what we do with words in English. But, you know, except for the word wall gallery, which is about the origins of words in English, um, you wouldn't really say it's about English, um, you know, and this, that largest gallery called The Spoken World is about, you know, all the variety of other languages, but it's just giving you a taste, a sampling. But we had a mother and daughter who spent their entire six hours in the museum in that gallery determined to do all 30 of the language lessons. <laughs> so, That's great. great. So you, you can do what you like. But yeah, I mean, mostly it's in English and uh, 
Right. Um, there's a, we, we just got a question in the room. We might as well ask it now if, yeah. if Beth is available. I was muted. One of our words oh. of the year. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I was looking for Beth's, uh, uh, Beth Chappelle's question that she just, just asked. There it is. Yeah, Beth. Yeah. Did you want to unmute and ask your question? Oh, Mike does not work. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll, uh, so Beth, we're just wondering about the, um, uh, the spoken word gallery. Do you, yeah, are you going to switch out languages, maybe represent some other languages, have some different ambassadors or? Uh, there aren't any plans for that right now. It's uh, extremely expensive for us to make hmm. those kinds of changes because we have to uh, do the research, write the script, do the hmm. recording, and then it often takes uh, rewriting software to introduce new elements or change things around. And what we've tried to do is have a good representation of the immigrant communities hmm. in Washington, uh, in that gallery, in the languages we chose, um, and elsewhere in the museum, we have other opportunities for little bits of other languages. Um, so, you know, it's these are pretty permanent exhibits compared to other museums that have aging temporary exhibits. Uh, ours mm -hmm. is these big gallery experiences are fairly permanent. And my idea always was, let's use the auditorium for, you know, panels and more timely, you know, subjects that come up in the news about language, things like that, uh, or have workshops. Um, so that was my solution to not changing out exhibits. Right, right. And that's, and you've done some events, but have you been in the auditorium or has it all been virtual so far? Our very first event in the auditorium is coming up in the next two weeks. Ah, the, the so pun, sad. the it's pun really, contest? Is it? it is, it's a um, yeah. <laughs> pun competition and that will be our first in-person event. That should be wonderful. Um, and then I, I suppose you're just this learning experience going through opening a museum during a pandemic. You're, um, I, I'm guessing that you're planning to do keep, I'm answering, I'm putting words in your mouth, answering a question for you, but I'm guessing you're going to continue to do some virtual stuff as well as, um, yes. you know, the live stuff. Is that true? You know, I was so against doing anything virtual. Hmm. And I told my board, you know, I we didn't hmm. renovate this building and, you know, and have a, a beautiful physical space in order to do things virtually. Well, you know, so much for that. Yeah. Uh, because what we found is uh, there's a, an audience all over America and even internationally for some of the programs we're doing virtually. And so we're having a, a wide, much wider range now, um, building a bigger community than we could just doing things at this one building in Washington, D.C. And uh, it's also great for attracting guest speakers. You know, there's, mm -hmm. they don't have to spend time flying and we don't pay you know that much so uh, it's it's, uh, it's actually turned out to be great we do virtual field trips for classrooms that have been um, attended by more than 4,000 students already so we're adding to that and um, you know it really I was wrong I have to say yeah. <laughs> I was wrong about that well a, a lot of us were I mean it, it's it, it's and I think things have changed to the point where we've gotten more comfortable with 
uh, the virtual space, the technology has improved. Um, so it, it uh, I, I suppose it came at the right time for acceptance of doing a show like this, you know, which we wouldn't have thought about doing a couple of years ago. And, and our curator of programming, Rebecca Roberts, is fantastic. She mm -hmm. did have a radio show of her own, um, and she's just a delightful moderator, host, and so we are lucky. Yeah. We had uh, at least one other question from the room, Heather. We do, yes. We have a question from Dana. Dana, if you want to unmute and ask. All right, thanks, Heather. Uh, my question was posted before you really got started talking. Um, I was imagining that this was a, a museum with books and stuff, but it sounds <laughs> like it's a lot of digital stuff. So the first part of my question, which was, where are you accessing your materials coming from? Um, that's probably not relevant, but I am curious about your funding. Um, you know, you've you've mentioned expenses, and um, I mean, renovating a building is not cheap. So I'm wondering, um, was this a lot of grassroots fundraising, or did you have significant organizations behind you, or how how did this you know come to be? You know, practically speaking, um, I did the restoration myself. I was the developer. I used my own money. Um, I was lucky to have it, and um, it was something that I thought it was worth doing. Even if the museum didn't succeed, to have a chance to save this iconic, important building that everyone in D.C. would go by and say, what is that building? It's so pretty, and it's, you know, it sticks out. It's red brick and in the middle of, you know, limestone Washington. Um, and so I did that. But at the same time, I formed a, a 501c3 nonprofit, got a governing board, uh, and started fundraising for the museum, which is the nonprofit tenant of basically, you know, my building. It's mm -hmm. not really mine. It still belongs to the District of Columbia, you know, but I have this 99 year lease, which is considered legally like tantamount to ownership. Um, and so I did uh, raise um, over $25 million from very generous mm -hmm. foundations and individuals who, who shared my belief in the importance of literacy. And uh, they are you know, we're all over the United States. So I was very lucky uh, and grateful to them. Cool. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a, a wonderful gift um, to those of us who love words. Uh, should we go back and I, we have some other slides and there are some other exhibits I wanted to find well, out about. Uh, Dana asked mm -hmm. about also, you know, there's no collection, there are no mm -hmm. artifacts. Mm -hmm. But there are books. They're not books really to read, but if you have a, a slide that shows the library, I'll tell about what happens there. Sure. So That's the library. Yeah. So the ceiling is mirrored, which doubles the height. You can kind of mm. tell where oh, that yeah. happens. So it's not as not as <laughs> you know as towering as it looks but it is very striking and all the books that face out where you see a book jacket they come to life on that uh central table we call it our story table and on the next slide i think mark it shows what i mean by they come to life oh this one yeah yeah so you take a book off the shelf that's Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds, and you open it to a specific place, and you can see the little strap that's on the pages. It, it keeps the books open um, to a certain place, and you put it in a, a little cradle, a little holder on the table, and there's a chip 
embedded in the binding. And mm -hmm. when the, you put the book in the holder, it triggers a projection, like a little movie trailer about the book. And mm -hmm. the idea is sort of like, you know, book reports, uh, you know, and I, I'll tell you more about <laughs> this book, but I'm not gonna give away the ending. And the mm -hmm. idea is to just tantalize you a little bit about every book um, so that you will want to read it. And um, there's sound and uh, art spilling over the book, They're on top of the book and around the book on the story table. And everything is closed captioned too. So um, it's all, the whole museum is accessible to the deaf. Mm -hmm. that, um, so this, so that's a physical book. What we're looking at here is the actual physical book, and then everything around it is projected, and then the exactly. And each and then, book yeah. is treated differently. Uh, different types of artwork, different approaches, um, mm -hmm. and so you know, a lot of people who come, they want to try all the different books and find out what happens when I open this book. And, yeah. You know, because they're all different. Right. Um, we had a question in the room about, uh, you mentioned the accessibility of the closed captioning. Was it, how much of a challenge was it to uh, create, you've got a historic building, you can't make changes to the inside. How accessible is it to uh, people in wheelchairs and... Yeah. Um, so I exaggerated a little. We were allowed to make certain changes. So one thing that happened was the original school building had two matching front doors and they were accessed by steep staircases, not accessible. So our architects said, we want to turn around the entrance of the building around to the back where there was a courtyard 14 feet sort of below ground and we covered that up made a new paved courtyard underneath now is found space it's meeting rooms and you know um, staff break room and that's mm. underground and then this new courtyard is level with the first floor in the lobby of the museum and they did allow us to make a new entrance back there where nobody can see they're more concerned with the front of the building you know being pristine but the back they didn't care so much about and so we have a glass vestibule entrance but the glass vestibule is not attached to the brick with nails or screws or anything it's a rubber gasket so hmm. even that is just you know the lightest touch on yeah. the landmark building and hmm. um inside the building we're allowed to take one wall down in order to merge two former classrooms into an auditorium that seats 150 people the auditorium we haven't used yet Right. Um, and then we uh, were able to insert two elevators inside the museum. Doesn't really disrupt anything, but mm. um, we could do that. Yeah, sounds like quite a quite a challenge. All right, we have a couple more uh, slides we didn't get to. Let me let's do those. We're running out of time, so. Sorry. Make sure we have to. No, no, don't be sorry. My goodness, this is this is so wonderful. Well, uh, all right. <laughs> oh, there you go. The um, yeah. so we have a songwriting gallery, and it's basically like a karaoke lounge with live uh, microphones and twenty three songs that you can pick from, and the songs are annotated on the screen so that while you're singing and singing the words to each song, you also uh, see highlighted what the songwriter was doing in terms of line technique, 
hmm. alliteration, and so forth. So it's it's fun, but you're practicing reading, and you might even be learning something. Yeah. Um, and this one, I this is this this one I think is really amazing. This is, the others are amazing, but yeah, this one is really popular and it's accessible for younger kids. So even if you can't read, you can enjoy this gallery. Um, it's a sort of a vocabulary building experience called Word Worlds. On three sides of this pretty small gallery are uh, panoramas that show a scene, a mountainous scene, a meadow scene, and then an urban scene. And you pick up one of these smart high-tech paintbrushes that are in a word palette. I don't know if you can see above those colored circles and the paintbrushes, there are some mm -hmm. words on the, on the walls, and those are all words for setting. Mm -hmm. um, so you're when you dip the brush in a word, like uh, you can see uh, nocturnal there, when you start painting the walls around you, the scene changes to a nighttime scene and the moon comes up. And so oh. all of these words, you can see what they mean by the effect they have on the panorama around you. Mm. And it's beautiful and magical and uh, we've had kids spend their whole entire time in there just painting away and trying different words and um, and adults too it's it's beautiful and fun well when people ask me what's my favorite word I tell them autumnal oh, and so I see that's it is that's represented there and so if you were Painting with autumnal, what do you think happens? I imagine it gets uh, a nice muted earthy colors to the All the, the trees, scene. the leaves change. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Lovely. <laughs> do you have a favorite word? Oh, that's in that in that gallery? No, no. Oh, no, no. But don't limit yourself. What? <laughs> uh, well, you know, this is such a cliche, but yeah. I love serendipity. But I also yeah. love cornucopia, mm. and I think that's because I'm from Iowa, and so <laughs> corn. Oh, yeah, sure, corn. <laughs> All right. Uh, we have um, more. I think we have uh, another couple of questions from one more person, and because we're we do, we'll do that quickly. Mm -hmm. Yes, Kate Carp, you want to unmute? Ask your questions. Yeah, hi, Anne. I think everybody here is open mouthed, even the ones with their faces gone. <laughs> The amount of work that went into this and everything else, wow. Um, first Thank question you. is, um, speaking of puns, where did who came up with Present Perfect for that gift shop? I did. Oh, that's well a, done. <laughs> that's amazing. Thank you. The other thing is, um, I um, live on the West Coast and would really like to see the, um, the pun event. Do you have any plans to live stream any of them? Well, we're doing that in partnership with a DC group that runs the event. And I don't believe it's live streamed. And I I can find out, but I, I'm pretty sure it's not, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, shucks. OK. But I'll, well, I'll, <laughs> I'll ask, and um, I'll let Mark know if, if I'm wrong. Wonderful. Maybe the future. Yeah, mm -hmm. that would be great. We're we're actually seeking funding right now to add some features to the auditorium so that we can do more of that, you know, kind of live streaming. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. So uh, one other question I wanted to ask when people leave the museum we've seen what the experience is what what's what's the takeaway that you hope that people uh, have that's such a good question because that's all we we've always talked about that hmm. so what happens when you leave the museum you should be more aware of the words you use more aware of the words 
behavior around you and more empathetic. People don't sound like you uh, because you haven't, I didn't go over all the galleries with you, but we have, our last gallery is called Words Matter. And there are people telling true stories about how words have had an impact in their lives. You know, people who were bullied or people from a different country, people who code switch, uh, yeah. people who use they, them as their, pron as their pronouns. Uh, you know, so we want people just to be more sensitive to the words that are being used around them for good or ill. Words have a lot of power and um, that's the message that we're hoping people will be careful. Use your words carefully. Choose them carefully. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to, to get there. Got no plans to go to D.C. soon, but I, I joined. I'm, I'm a member of the Planet Word oh, thank you. Museum from the start, and I, I love the mission. Um, your your list of uh, your advisory, you got this amazing advisory board, some just really wonderful linguists and uh, people in the word field, and we're basically getting our list of future guests for the show from, from that. We've had... <laughs> We've had um, we've had Ben Zimmer uh, on more than once. We've had uh, David Crystal, and in two weeks we're, we'll have Gretchen McCullough, who's on your oh, advisory fantastic. board. So yeah, uh, Ann Curzon. We're trying to get her in the fall, but she's a little he bit busy. He was with... our um, advisor who vetted our word wall script. Oh, nice, excellent. Yeah. Okay, well, well, if we get her back in the if we get her uh, next month, we'll have, we'll ask her about that. So. Um, Thank you very much. We're, we're, we've done an hour and uh, we appreciate it very much. I think uh, I, I, I try not to look at the chat too much, but I, I see the little comments and it seems like everybody's agog, like Kate said. Um, so Please we're come all. Visit. Yes. Join as a member, uh, listen to our virtual program, sign up. Um, we would love to have all these word enthusiasts you know, being part of the Planet Word family. Yeah, terrific. Oh, I forgot. I was going to ask, I asked you this before the show. I, I thought when you came on, I said, um, I was maybe a little rude. I said, your background's kind of, you know, plain. I expected more. But then you told me what was actually on that back oh. wall. <laughs> and now the sun is coming in and hitting me in the chin. Um, yeah. <laughs> on the back wall is a, a custom-made wallpaper. I chose 12 pages of The Secret Garden, which was my favorite book as a child. And the author, Frances Hodgson Burnett, actually lived a block away from the Franklin School in the 1890s. And so that was just hmm. too good to be true. And um, so I interspersed pages of The Secret Garden with uh, an encyclopedia of the meanings of flowers. Oh, nice. All, All right, well, thank Coming in from the West. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, Anne. It's been a wonderful hour. Very interesting. Uh, appreciate um, all you've done there, and we're all, we're all coming to see it. So. You better, and tell me when you come, <laughs> and I, I would love to greet every one of you. All right. All right. Two weeks, everybody. We'll be back with Gretchen McCullough. Um, and we also have a special guest at the end of the month we can't announce yet. So stay tuned. We'll announce it in a couple of weeks. See you, everybody. See you in two weeks, everybody.